today is Ibrahim Durrani. Ibrahim Durrani is a founding member of the Middle Eastern Federation of Medical Physics. He also represented Lebanon as the charter member for establishing IMPCB and has served on many committees since. Recently, he joined Varian Medical Systems as a senior medical physicist after working as a chief medical physicist and division safety officer from June 2004 to September 2021 at RUH Hospital in Beirut. Ibrahim Durrani, sir, please. The stage is yours. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, so we can see your slides. Yes, Ibrahim. Yes, yes good afternoon, uh, Gulam. It's good to see you. Uh, again, uh, the, we ha have been uh, cooperating many years back uh, in the Middle East. And uh, as uh, Mansoor said, the, our, uh, mo our most aim is to go to our students and uh, freshly graduates and uh, to give them opportunities to uh, develop and be better than our generation. You know, and uh, I, uh, I've also worked with uh, 2D plans before the, uh, you know, the establishment of the new technologies. And this new generation, they have a, the best options with the internet. They can find anything related to medical physics and they can be a, a problem solvers. So my, my first slide is this. Maybe we share, we, I want to um, uh, take some opinions. What is a medical physicist does so of course this is a water phantom but we only uh, we don't only use it for um, you know to um, do uh, uh, calibrations of the beam but we also need to uh, solve problems when you don't have some means like for example in this uh, setting uh, this is i done uh, a couple months ago in a small hospital they don't have a sink so that I cannot fill the, the, the tank. So I use these buckets to fill the tank. And after that, I use my plumbing, uh, you know, technique to uh, empty the, the water phantom and uh, also using physics, as you know. So this is the olden days when we were kids, we used to put like a small uh, hose and we blow from, in the, from the other end so that the gravity of the water goes down with a, with a simple blow from your mouth. So this is the techniques that medical physics has to solve, you know, during their uh, daily job. So uh, my, my talk is about uh, chapter eight, one of the most difficult chapters in uh, Han's book. And uh, I will try to make it as, um, you know, uh, as easy to you as possible. So chapter eight is a, a um, a big chapter that describes the definition of the absorbed dose. Also, uh, part two, relation between kerma, exposure, and uh, dose. Uh, third part is the calculation of dose from the uh, ex uh, exposure. Uh, part four is the Bragg-Gray gravity theory. Five is the calibration of mega voltage beams uh, starting from TG21 and TG51. And uh, part six is the IATRS 398 protocol. Of course, Ibrahim, there's a uh, part seven. Ibrahim, yes. You cannot see your next uh, next slide. Only the first slide is here. Ah, uh, okay. Let me. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, can you please do the slideshow? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. The slideshow. No. Yeah, you can play the slideshow and then you can just change it. Up to now, no slideshow, please. Now you can see. Uh, no. It is not slideshow. This simple. We can see your mouse moving, but you haven't ran the slideshow yet. Ah, uh, okay. Show. Go down, sir. Uh, what's the option that I have to press? Mm. Uh, so it's just right next to the zoom button. Shift yeah. F5. Shift F5? Yes. Shift F5. There is a bar, it is called slideshow. You go to the slideshow and then 
start. Yeah, please slideshow. Yeah, I'm I'm putting slideshow here. One participant can share the these slides at a time. You are sharing the screen. Uh, okay, so let me share the slide, not the screen window or share the entire screen. Now is better? But your bar, there is a slideshow. You should you should uh, click the slideshow and then. Uh, yeah, then this button. Yes. Can you please click it? Yes, you can uh, both this option. This one, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's good. good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So now you can see. Okay. Now is nice. Yeah. 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 The uh, first uh, slash the defini definition of the absorbed dose and the uh, other, uh, the difference between exposure, absorbed dose and the dose. For the exposure, it is applicable only to the photon beams in air with energy less than three MeV. And is the absorbed dose is defined for all types of radiation, charged and uncharged particles, all materials and all energies. The absorbed dose also, we can call it as the dose, is defined as the mean energy imparted by ionizing radiation to a given material per unit mass. And this is the formula is the uh, imparted energy per unit mass of material. The old units used to be was the rad, which is the uh, uh, 100 ergs per gram or 0 0.01 joule per kilogram. Whereas the SI units for this is one gray, which is one joule per kilogram or 100 rads. For the relation between Kerma exposure and absorbed dose, we can go uh, for each um, uh, one at a, at a time. Uh, is it because Abu Ghulam is sharing your screen? Is that because you you are I, because I cannot see uh, my my screens my uh, my, uh, my sharing, uh, I think video? I, I, I stop sharing. You stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Now you can see me. Yes. Okay. For the Kerma is the kinetic energy but released slide. in the video. You, should put, put your uh, slide. you actually stop sharing your slide. Oh. Share entire screen. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, but why I have Abu Zakaria is sharing your screen? Uh, you can yeah. press on the hide and. Okay, yeah, that's... that's it. And so again, coming back to the Kerma is the kinetic energy released in the medium, which is defined as the, uh, the energy, uh, all the kinetic energy of all charged particles liberated by the neutral particles, the photons in a material of mass, the M. And the uh, Kerma could be also defined as the photon energy fluence multiplied by the uh, energy transfer divided by the rho, which is has the uh, unit of gray or joule per kilogram, same as the, the dose. And the kerma is divided into two parts, the collision kerma and the radiation kerma. The collision kerma is the part of the energy loss due to the collision with the atoms, resulting in the ionization and excitations where the uh, uh, phi is the photon energy fluence. The radiate kerma is the part of energy loss in producing green stuttering photons. So adding these two together, we will have the uh, full range of uh, the kerma. In relation to the exposure, exposure is defined as the uh, as ionization produced in air applicable to photons up to three 
MEV only. Exposure is the ionization equivalent of the collision kerma in air and is calculated as the follows, which is equal to the collision kerma divided by the amount of energy required to produce one ion pair in air, which is equal to 33.97 electron volt per ion pair or uh, joule per kilogram. This formula is uh, to calculate the exposure from uh, you know, the uh, amount of energy required to produce one electron, one ion pair in air. So what is the relationship between kerma and exposure? This is, could be related to the uh, graph. Uh, and uh, the kerma for equilibrium, if we don't have any contamination, you can see that the, uh, the dose increases as it goes in the depth. The kerma stays the, the constant and they meet at, uh, you know, at a certain depth. And in this case, the, uh, uh, the under transient equilibrium, the, the beta could be equal to one, which is the ratio between the dose and the collision kerma. Whereas in the actual case, when we have photon attenuation, the kerma is now uh, uh, going down as uh, going to the depth, the same thing for, for the dose. And uh, they meet uh, at a build-up region after the build-up region where we have the B is less than one and at the uh, midpoint when they meet, they go into the transient equilibrium uh, and they go parallel where we have the kerma is less than the dose. Okay, this is a, a summary for the uh, relation between kerma exposure and the absorbed dose. You can see that exposure is the, the amount of charge per unit mass and one Röntgen equals to 2.58 10 minus four Coulomb per kilogram. For the kerma, it's the energy transfer per unit mass and it has a one gray as a unit. Whereas for the absorbed dose or the dose is the energy absorbed by the medium divided by the uh, mass and the same unit as for the kerma. Now, the part three is how to calculate the absorbed dose from exposure. So first we have to calculate the absorbed dose to air under conditions of electron equilibrium. We can get the dose of uh, the dose in air is the collision kerma in air, which is the exposures times the amount of energy uh, needed to uh, transfer one ion pair of electron uh, to uh, with, uh, with volt. And this is uh, uh, Coulomb of charges per kilogram of air. So the dose in air, which is equal to, if we can replace the uh, uh, W over E with 33.97, we can have the dose in air is equal to 0 0.876 times the exposure in air. And this is the factor that we want to, um, uh, you know, multiply after we measure the exposure in air, we can get the uh, dose in air for a certain radiation. And this is the Röntgen to rad conversion factor for air. The first is question, the unit of exposure is A, gray per coulomb, B, rad per coulomb, C, Coulomb per kilogram, D joule per gray, and E joule per kilogram. So Asad, you wanna run the poll? Hello? Poll is running. Uh, I think you can see the poll. No, I'm not seeing the poll. That's the... Uh... Okay. okay, fine, no problem. I will let you know. Okay, the answer is uh, like uh, Coulomb per kg is 51% and uh, joules per kg is 24%. People have answered. Ah, uh, so. Uh, the, uh, red per Coulomb, <laughs> is... some of the audience have uh, red per Coulomb and some of them are gray per Coulomb. And of course, the correct answer is C, it's Coulomb per kilogram. This okay. is a tricky question. It comes many times in the board exam. 
so uh, the people get confused with the um, you know units. Okay, so now you know that the uh, uh, unit of exposure is coulomb per kilogram is the the amount of charge per unit mass. So from the definition, you can you know get the answer. Second is the calculation of absorbed dose from exposure. So now we can move the, uh, the, the calculation from exposure, uh, calculation the dose from exposure in air to absorb dose to any medium. So under the same conditions of charge particle equilibrium, the dose to medium is equal to the energy fluence in the medium divided by uh, you know, uh, mu over rho of the medium. So if we want to uh, compare uh, to uh, divide the dose in medium to dose in air, we can get, you know, the, uh, the this formula where we have the uh, energy fluence divided by the mu with the rho with the medium and the air. So by uh, um, you know putting back the uh, the two to get the dose in medium, we have the dose in medium equals to the F is the medium, which is the F factor. Again, is the Rankine to rad conversion factor, and it goes to air to those to medium conversion. It is a function of the material composition and the photon energy. So we have tables of the F factor depending on the uh, material that is composed of the uh, uh, in the medium and the photon energy, and so we multiply by the. Uh, uh, this factor times the exposure we measure and multiply by the A, which is the, uh, you know, the ratio of the photon energy fluence from the medium to the air. So this formula is quite useful to get the dose in the medium if you want to measure the exposure in air. So the third part is how to calculate the absorbed dose from exposure using the dose calibration with an ion chamber in air. So we have for mega voltage beams build up cap is needed to provide electron equilibrium. This is in air, we got the measured uh, values is corrected reading from uh, uh, temperature and pressure. Then we uh, 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 convert, we can get the exposure which multiply by uh, the reading we got by the NX, which is the exposure calibration factor for a given chamber for the same beam quality. And this is a, a, is a, a, a fixed value. Uh, it relates to the chamber itself. And this we can move to the dose uh, uh, in free space, uh, which is the uh, F tissue which is the factor exposure to those conversion factor for this tissue multiplied by the exposure that we got in, in air multiplied by the A, which is the uh, ratio of the energy fluence from tissue to air. So by this, we can calculate the dose calibration from if we have uh, a calibrated ionization chambers to get the dose in free space. The fourth part is the calculation of the absorbed dose from exposure using the dose measurements from exposure with ion chamber in a medium. If we have a uh, ion chamber in the medium, we get the uh, uh, measured value. Of course, we use the chamber with build up cap. So again, we get the uh, exposure calculated as the measured value times the NX and the dose in the medium is the F medium, which is the uh, factors around into uh, uh, a gray factor multiplied by the exposure times the uh, uh, ratio of uh, photon, uh, photon fluence energy from the medium to the cavity here. So with this, we can get the full dose to the medium based on the measurements that we've done in the medium. The fourth part is the bragg gray cavity theory. Is uh, basically it is how to convert dose to cavity air to dose to the medium by applying, you know, the differential equations to get the, uh, you know, uh, 
the summation of the those energies fluence from the electron per area of uh, incidence we can get you know the uh, uh, the do the total dose imparted to the medium and this is the formula using the stopping power ratio between the medium and uh, the 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 uh, the stopping power is the collision stopping power average over the electron energy spectrum. And we have we can get uh, tables for the stopping powers depending on the energy of the incident electrons. So based on that, we can get the, uh, the dose in the gas, which is the fluence times the stopping power, and uh, which is equal to the uh, JG is the charge produced per unit mass of air times the W over E, which is 33.97. Then we convert it to the medium. We multiply by the stopping power of the medium. So this is the cavity moving, assuming that the fluence is not affected when moving from, you know, the uh, when taking out the um, uh, ion chamber. So by this, if we can uh, do the uh, dose medium to the dose in the gas cavity, which is the ratio of the stopping powers from the medium to the gas cavity. And uh, by uh, uh, putting these values together, we can get the dose to the medium as this formula, which is also a factor of the stopping power ratio between the medium to the gas cavity. The Bragg theory stopping power, and uh, this is what we get. Uh, the of course, the uh, the values in the stopping power should uh, exclude low energy electrons, where energy is less than a delta is the cutoff energy. We uh, the delta is the electron energy required to cross the cavity. Typically, it's around 10 keV, so we have to exclude it from the calculation. And the stopping power is the restricted mass collision stopping power with delta as the cutoff energy. To exclude high energy delta rays when energy is greater than a small delta that are produced and then escape from the cavity. So for the chamber volume, uh, how to calculate the chamber volume from the, uh, uh, the, the values that we uh, have? If the chamber volume is none, the JJ can be obtained from this formula, you know, where Q is the charge produced and rho is the density of the cavity air. But if we don't uh, have the, uh, uh, the volume cannot be accurately measured directly, we have to calculate it using the formulas and can be indirectly determined from the chamber exposure calibration factor and X and the Bragg ray cavity theory they can, uh, uh, you know, do the calculations based on the following, you know, derivations. So how to calculate the chamber volume? So first of all, we get the uh, dose of the chamber in air. And this will get the chamber with wall and built up uh, cap. We get the dose of uh, the dose in the wall. And then we can, this is the Bragg ray theory. This is the electron fluence. And the, uh, to get the dose in air, we can go with this formula to get the transient uh, uh, in the condition. If we have a transient electron equilibrium exists. So combining the equations for those of the chamber in air to those uh, of the wall and those in air, we have the dose in air with this uh, formula and we can measure with a, a chamber with the, an exposure calibration factor and x of the chamber we can get the dose in air as uh, such again the chamber this is the uh, m is the chamber reading corrected for recombination p ion and x is the chamber exposure calibration factor corrected for recombination a ion and this will be the exposure. This is the K factor, it's, which is the conversion between uh, uh, Coulomb per kilogram per Rankin. 
and this is the energy for uh, to get ion pair 33.97 joule per kilogram and this is b converts from kerma to dose b factor combining the two previous equations for uh, dose in air we have the j in air as such and uh, the uh, we included the a wall which is the change of photon energy influence due to the wall and build up cap and so we included the a wall here in the formula and this will a wall and build up cap made of different materials alpha is the fraction of electrons generated in the wall this is many uh, in many ion chambers we have the wall and it is different than the material of the, the the ion chamber so we have to multiply by an alpha factor to get compensated for the difference in the materials this is the alpha factor and from the previous slide, we can uh, uh, put down the J of air, which is the charge produced per unit mass of air in the chamber. And as such, combining the two equations, we can uh, reach out to calculate the volume of the chamber from the NX value of the chamber, if we have uh, such. So this is using the Bragg ray theory, we can calculate the actual volume of the chamber using the derivations of the previous, uh, you know, theory. So the Bragg ray theory, cavity theory, we have an effective point of measurement depending on the type of the uh, chamber that you use. For the effective point of measurements in the parallel plane chambers, the effective point is the measurement is at the inner face of the front plate as this point here. This is the plane parallel. You are seeing a side view of the uh, plane parallel chamber and the effective measurement is just at the surface of the chamber. Whereas for the cylindrical chamber, the effective point of measurement is displaced and it is around 0 0.85 times the radius of this uh, ion chamber cylinder from the center. And the effective point is not in the middle, but it is, you know, peripheral around 0 0.85 uh, times the radius of the ion chamber. And this we can uh, calculate it also by the Bragg ray theory using the effective point of measurement, uh, using the formula and the geometry for the cylinder. So this is the uh, formula on how we got the uh, effective measurements is based on the uh, mathematical derivations for the uh, uh, cylindrical shape of the uh, chamber. And thus we got the effective measurements of the exposure is 0 0.85 times the radius of the uh, cylindrical chamber. The second question is, Bragg ray cavity theory applies only when there is A, transient equilibrium, B, standard temperature and pressure, C, water medium, D, electronic equilibrium, and E, no photon scattering. Asad, you're running the uh, poll? Yes, I'm running the poll. Right now, it's um, around 60% electronic equilibrium and 20% transient. Some of them are again, going with Again, this scattering. is also a question that could uh, also uh, in the board exams, they usually uh, trick students on what is the condition of the Bragg ray cavity theory application. Forty participants has answered total uh, total and fifty seven percent is second. Okay, so the the uh, uh, correct answer is D for those who uh, uh, choose number D is the correct answer. The Bragg ray cavity theory applies only if we have electronic equilibrium. 
and this is the uh, the the most applicable conditions to have the Bragg-Fay cavity theory. Okay, now after the uh, uh, the Bragg-Fay cavity theory, we can go to the calibration of our mega voltage beams, which is in the LINAC. We want to make sure that the dose we are planning, we are giving to the patients is exactly what is supposed to be. So we have to calibrate our um, machine regularly and make sure to um, uh, uh, be accurate in this measurements. So using the cavity gas calibration factor, the N gas, which is uh, uh, intrinsic for the ion chamber that you have, this is defined as the absorbed dose to the cavity gas per unit charge produced in the cavity and it has a unit of gray per coulomb so the end gas is we can get it from you know a lab to to the values of the end gas from the labs for each chamber where the dose in air is the dose to the chamber cavity in air and uh, q is the charge produced in the cavity and the end gas is equal to the dose in air divided by the m which is collected charge or the meter reading divided multiplied by the p ion which is the recombination loss in the uh, the cavity and we we can do measure this with the cobalt 60 uh, you know uh, non radiation and this we use the chamber with wall and build up on the uh, cavity with this we can get uh, the, make sure that the angle is unique to ionization chamber determined entirely its cavity volume. So the end gas is a, a, is a fixed number, is a fixed depending on the volume of the cavity. And by uh, uh, putting all together, we can get this end gas from a calibrated lab or calculated based on the volume of the ion chamber that we have. For the TG21 protocol, uh, we're going from the dose in air, uh, calculate the dose in air, and then we calculate the dose in wall, and we get the calculate the dose in medium. From all of these, we can get the dose in medium as the dose in air multiplied by the, uh, uh, the ratio of uh, the stopping power from the medium to the air times the wall times the uh, repel and this is for the photons and this is for the electrons and again the tg21 um, many centers still using it and um, uh, uh, the uh, the new protocols uh, we will talk about them the tg51 and the trs 9398 so the most important uh, aspect of doing the calibration is this first step is to make sure that your water phantom is leveled you know because if your water phantom is leveled your ion chamber will be leveled and uh, uh, you you will have a very accurate you know measured uh, results so this is uh, the uh, the, um, uh, the the uh, ruler or the the uh, we used to level our our water phantom on the table. For the calibration of the mega voltage beam uh, using the TG51, the TG51 protocol is based on absorbed dose to water calibration uh, uh, also in a cobalt 60 beam. So the chamber calibration factor is denoted that N cobalt 60 to uh, dose and in water. The calibrated chamber can be used in any beam modality, uh, photon or electron beams, and any energy in water. The formalism is simpler than the TG21, but it is applicable in water only. So we have to use water in uh, doing the TG51 protocol. So what equipments you need? First of all, you need the ion chamber and electrometer to measure the uh, radiation with electrometer. The ion chamber, of course, has to be calibration traceable to a standard laboratory so that you can get the N values for the ion chamber. Uh, you have to have a waterproofing for the ion chamber if needed. Uh, you have to have a water phantom at least 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters cube. You have to have a lead foil for photons of 10 MV and above. 
uh, one millimeter thickness. And you have to have a system to measure air pressure and water temperature. So that to include the uh, CTP correction factor. And uh, this is we use actually in our, um, uh, you know, services we do. We have uh, compiled uh, all these equipment in a box. And this uh, box uh, uh, contain the water phantom. So the at least 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters cube. And do we have the iron chamber, the cables, and all necessary equipments that comes with it. So it's a complete box. We, uh, we use it to different centers. We ship it to different centers. And it and is an easy way to do the calibration uh, for each center using you know, a, a unified set of equipment so that you can be able to uh, compare each center that you are doing the calibration. For to obtain and absorb dose to water calibration factor, we need a cobalt 60 source. This is the uh, N uh, uh, for the ion chamber and gas. So the dose to water per unit charge reading, this is, we can get it from a, a traceable lab. When you send your uh, equipment for calibration, they will send you the N cobalt 60 uh, dose for your ion chamber and sometimes with the electrometer together. This is uh, setting up the water phantom, as I tell you, the important thing is uh, maybe it takes probably uh, sometimes more than an hour to set the water phantom. So don't worry, uh, you're, you're okay with that because uh, the, uh, uh, a good measurement start with a good setup. If you set up your water phantom correctly as you know, uh, uh, on the uh, spot, you will have, you will save time repeating the measurements again, because uh, uh, setting up the water phantom takes some time, but it is worth it. Uh, the second uh, uh, parameter is the quality conversion factor, KQ. Uh, ideally for a given chamber individual calibration factor, the N, uh, QD gas should be obtained for each beam quality used in the clinic so that the, the, the dose uh, from this quality to in water would be uh, is equal to the measured the corrected measured uh, you know uh, values multiplied by the n factor this is impractical as the standard laboratory may not have all the particular beam quality that is available so what they do is that they include the conversion factor KQ, which is introduced to convert the calibration factor for cobalt 60 to any beam quality that you have. So in, 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 in most of the calibration labs, they do calibration only based on the cobalt 60 unit because which is a non value. So uh, they cannot do all the calibration for your ion chamber based uh, you know, on all the energies that you might have. So instead of that, the, you can get the uh, KQ value, which is a conversion factor to change from cobalt 60 unit to any radiation energy beam that you have in your clinic. And these KQ values, they are tabulated according to the uh, ion chambers that you have. We can see uh, later on some of these tables. So the general formalism for the uh, uh, calibration TG51, if you have a cobalt 60 beam, you just, uh, you don't need the KQ uh, values because uh, the, uh, your beam is in, on, in cobalt 60, you're calibrating a cobalt 60 unit. So you, use, you, you need only the M, which is the corrected measured uh, values uh, multiplied by the N value, which you get from the lab. In other, photon beams, uh, only cylindrical chamber allowed at this present, you have to include the KQ factor, which is the conversion between cobalt uh, 60 and the, do the energy that you have in your clinic. For the electron beam, again, it is uh, this formula that we will uh, uh, discuss in, in details later on. So this is the general formalism of the TG51. As you can see, it's uh, uh, simpler than the uh, TG21, which has you know, only like three uh, discrete values that you can go and we can 
go through the steps uh, later on. So what are the charge measurements? The M, which is the total charge measurement, corrected for polar polarity corrections. And how we can get the P polarity is by uh, doing measurements with the positive uh, uh, bias minus a negative bias with the raw data divided by 2M of the uh, raw measurements. For the pressure and temperature correction, the STP or PTP is, uh, you have to correct for the pressure, you have to measure the temperature uh, in the water phantom and uh, make sure to, uh, to uh, of the pressure in the room. Sometimes many people, they don't have the barometers available. So what I do is I call the um, nearest airport or nearest, you know, meteorological uh, office and ask them for the, uh, for the pressure. And of course, you can use the internet and see what is the pressure in your area or in your city. And uh, if it is, uh, uh, if your area is like in a, a, a different level, you have to correct for the level uh, for, for the pressure calculation. But in any way, most of the, uh, you know, uh, centers, they should have at least a thermometer and a barometer to measure in the room so that to get an accurate results. For the electrometer correction, P electro, also this is uh, uh, coming from the calibration lab. lab. They, they will send the, you this value when you send your calibration and electrometer together. Sometimes it is included in the M and sometimes it is uh, separate. The uh, uh, part, the ion recombination correction, uh, P ion, uh, you have to do it. You uh, measuring the uh, uh, in in the clinic. So uh, the V is the voltage of the bias of the electrometer. You you put two uh, two voltage. For example, I use three hundred and one hundred and fifty. You know, for high voltage and uh, low voltage is one hundred and fifty in the middle. So you put this formula to calculate the ion recombination correction factor. And uh, this is the voltage, and these are the uh, measured values from the ion chamber and the electrometer for the high voltage bias and uh, for the low voltage bias, and you divide them together and you apply this formula to get the P ion correction factor. So by this, the M, uh, which has all these correction factors included when you measure the, uh, uh, the row values you multiply by these correction factors so that you get the m corrected value for all of these correction factors and these are the kq values for cylindrical chambers in photon beams you know depending on the type of the chamber that you have so you, you either uh, extrapolate depending on the percentage that stores energy and then you can get the kq value or you can use a tabulated you know, uh, 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 tables that you can give you the exact uh, uh, number or exact value of the KQ values depending on the energy. So the point of measurement and effective point of measurements, as we said before, the same thing before cylindrical chambers, before photons, the uh, effective point of measurements is 0 0.6 times the cavity radius of the uh, ion chamber. For the electrons, is 0.5 times the radius of the cavity. For plane parallel uh, plate, the point of measurement is just at the surface of the plate. For the person depth dose ionization for photon beams, the person depth dose to be measured at SSD 100 centimeter for 10 by 10 field size. Uh, and here we have different curves, the ionization and the uh, person depth dose. The, for the parallel uh, plate chamber, we measured curve two, which is a slightly, uh, you know, uh, uh, different. If we have, if we use cylindrical chamber, we have to account for the uh, measurement, uh, uh, effective measurement place, and which we calculated here for the cylindrical. So we have to multiply by 0 0.6 times the radius of the cavity. So this, we have a shift, you know, uh, for the cylindrical chamber, we have a shift of the graph to uh, graph uh, one to get the curve two. 
So curve two is the per centers or per set ionization curve, including contaminated electrons. And again, this is in, in water. For the beam quality specification for the photons, in this protocol, the photon beam quality is specified by the percentage of uh, uh, depth dose at uh, depth of 10, and the percent depth dose at 10 centimeter depth in water due to the photon component only. We do not have any con electron contamination. This is we have to include uh, exclude it. For low energy, less than 10 MB with uh, a percentage depth dose less than 75%, the uh, ionization is equal to the percent depth dose at 10 CM. We have a negligible uh, electron contamination. For high energy, we have a higher uh, electron contamination. So we have to modify the formula, multiply by this factor to get the percent depth ionization values. A more accurate method requires the use of one millimeter thick lead foil placed about 50 centimeter from the surface. So if we have a higher energy because to get uh, the uh, contamination, electron contamination away from the, uh, uh, excluding it from the formula, we have to put a lead uh, foil here, which is uh, around 50 centimeter away uh, from the surface of the uh, water phantom, one millimeter will, uh, of lead filter will be enough to, uh, you know, uh, take out any uh, electron contamination so that the, we have the percent of those ionization according to this formula uh, below. So this is, will uh, generate its own contaminated electrons. For the reference condition for photon beams, we have uh, for the SSD setup, 100 SSD uh, and 10 by 10 centimeters field size, and also at a 10 centimeter depth, you can do the measurements. For SAD setup, you have the SAD from the photon source to the uh, water is 100 centimeter at a depth of 10 centimeter and the field size at a depth of 10 centimeter at the SID setup would be 10 by 10 field size. So depending on your preference, uh, some people, they prefer to have the SSD setup calibration. So in both cases, they give the same results, but you have to make sure that you uh, uh, notify how the calculation based on your clinic. For the uh, photon beam dosimetry, so the uh, dose uh, calculation um, uh, in water for your uh, energy is the M, the corrected, fully corrected uh, measured values multiplied by the quality conversion factor, KQ, multiplied by the absorbed dose to water ionization chamber factor, which you will get from the lab after you sent your uh, ion chamber for calibration. Usually the calibration uh, you have to send it uh, every two years uh, uh, for your ion chamber to make sure that the, do, the, uh, the values stays the same. So basically, once you uh, plug in this, you can calculate the dose to your uh, uh, dose in water for your machine. Again, this is the barometer and this is the uh, temperature, uh, digital temperature. And many of you are wondering what is this photo is here? So you can see a mouse and a, a watch. Uh, actually, uh, as I told you, uh, we should be a problem solver. You know, I, I had uh, a problem in, in the clinic is that, you know, when I set up the, uh, the, the, the water phantom, and I uh, plugged in the program to do the, uh, you know, profiles for the machine. So each time I go back and forth to the room. So we have the computer uh, uh, because uh, we work in a company, they will make sure that the computer should lock, you know, if you don't move uh, the mouse within one, one minute, you know, and we cannot uh, change that, uh, you know, uh, option. It is by default by the IT security manager of the company. 
So in order to overcome this, because each time when I go inside the room to, uh, you know, change, you know, the uh, feed size or change the uh, setting, uh, I go back, I go uh, outside and see my uh, screen is locked. I have to log in, put a long password each time. So I figured out a way is that uh, I put my watch underneath a mouse, the, the mouse of the computer. So it is moving all the time. So this I could uh, save time in logging back for back uh, uh, on the computer each time I go inside the room. So we I solved the problem with this and I, I sent this to my manager and he said, oh my God, this is a very good way to solve this issue because we cannot change the setting of the computer to have it unlocked after one minute. Okay, so what is the reference condition for the electron beam? Again, the, uh, the depth, the reference depth is calculated based on 0 0.6 times the R50, which is the depth in water at which the dose is 50% of the maximum dose. And the D reference is approximately at D max most of the time. For field size, uh, for 10 by 10 field size on the surface, we use, uh, if we have the R50 less than 88.5 centimeter, and we use 20 by 20 uh, field size if the R50 is greater than 8.5 centimeter. For the SSD as used in the clinic between 90 and 110, typically it's 100 SSD, so we can get the dose, uh, uh, the calibrated dose to water, for the electron beam as such. And we will explain those factors in this uh, slides later. So the person depth ionization for electron beams, we got the ionization at the measured SSD 100 centimeter for field size uh, 10 by 10 and 20 by 20, depending on the uh, uh, energy and the R50. For the plane parallel chamber, we measured the R uh, the curve two, and when we do the uh, uh, shift, we uh, get the I1, the uh, curve I1 to get the uh, curve. The two is a percent ionization curve, depending on the ionization for the electrons. And this is the R50, how to calculate it based on the ionization 50. We calculate it based on the, uh, you know, the, this graph. For the electron beam dosimetry, the gradient correction, P gradient, uh, we have to include it in our uh, correction, which depends on the user beam and has to be measured in the clinic. Uh, for the cylindrical chamber, the PG is measured according to the, we measure the uh, row data and we multiply by the uh, reference plus the shift of the effective uh, measured upstream by the 0 0.5 times the radius of the cavity. For the parallel plate chamber, the this value is equal to one because we don't with the effective measurement of the plane parallel chamber is at the surface. For the electron beam quality, K E calibration is the photon to electron conversion factor. And this has been tabulated according to the type of the chamber that you have. And uh, you can get these values from the manufacturer according to the uh, uh, specifications of the chamber that you have. So the electron beam dosimetry is the electron beam conversion factor from K EQ to K to Q. And for the chamber, the cylindrical and parallel plate chamber are available in uh, the figures that, uh, next in the book. And for the cylindrical and for the parallel plate chambers, uh, these values can also be incorporated and in, uh, you can um, get them from this curve or you can calculate them based on the, these values. So you can interpolate these, uh, the, K, the K prime R 50 for cylindrical chambers. And these are values for the plane parallel chambers so that you can include them in your calculation. So for the electron dosimetry, the final formula is as such, where M is the fully corrected chamber reading. 
the PQ gradient is the correction factor that accounts for the ionization gradient at the point of measurements for cylindrical chambers only, because P is equal to one for plane parallel. Uh, the K prime R50 is the electron quality conversion factor. And the KEKL is the photon to electron conversion factor fixed for a given chamber model. These all values are tabulated that you can uh, check on uh, the uh, uh, specification of your, of your uh, chamber. And of course, the, N, uh, the cobalt D gas, which is the absorbed dose to water chamber calibration factor that you receive from the calibration lab. So uh, once you got uh, these values, uh, uh, you, this is you can measure. These you can get from tabulation or you can interpolate from the graph, uh, previous graph. This you will get from the uh, uh, calibration lab, and then you measure the uh, the uh, the uh, the raw data, and you also we multiply by the correction factors that we discussed before to get the fully corrected measured data, and this we get get the electron the dose to the water for this beam. As a summary, so we get the traceable N gas uh, for the ion chamber. We measure the person that's ionization. If we have more than uh, 10 MV, we use the lead uh, sheet. Uh, we deduce the photon beam from the ionization. We measure the raw data at 10 centimeter depth, no depth shift, and then we multiply by these correction factors to the measured raw data. We look up the KQ for the chamber and we calculate the dose to the dose water for your beam. The same thing for the electron. This is the steps that you follow to do the uh, dose calibration for your electron beam. Uh, this picture was taken in October 19, 2021 in Michigan. It was, I have a full moon. The bad thing about this picture is that, you know, after a second, I had an accident. <laughs> but the good thing is that uh, whenever you see the full moon, you praise uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and uh, for uh, the beautiful sign of the full moon. So the third question is, uh, KQ equals to one at energy around six MV, B at around energy 10 MV, uh, C at around energy 6 MeV, D at around energy 1.25 MV or 1.25 MeV. You can run the poll. Yeah, the poll is running. And, uh... And we mentioned that so now in the, the six MV is forty-two percent answer, and uh, the one point five MV has thirty-one percent people. Uh, Ten MV is twenty-five percent. Uh huh. <laughs> so we have some discrepancy. Okay. So six MV is higher. Like thirteen people have answered six MV, around thirty-nine. Wow. People. So uh, they should reread the, uh, uh, of course, you can give them the slides, right, uh, Assad, for everybody? The PDF slides, you can share them to the uh, audience. So the correct answer is D, 1.25, which is the cobalt 60 average energy. We said in the, uh, you know, in the, um, a calibration if you have if you are calibrating uh, a, you, a cobalt 60 unit you don't need to have any kq because the kq value would be one right but if you are calibrating a, a, a different energy 6 10 uh, 15 18 mv or any other energy you have to get a kq values other than one which is you get get it from the tabulated or interpolation of the graph so kq equals one at an energy of the cobalt 60 if you have calibration or you're doing a calibration of your own cobalt 60 unit. Okay. 
Okay, let's move on to the uh, the part number six. Part number six is the IAEA TRS 398 protocol. And uh, the development of this protocol has paralleled that of the APMPG51. They are very similar, exactly the same. Consequently, the two protocols are very similar in their formalisms, and both are based on a cobalt, on an absorbed dose to water calibration of the ion chamber in a cobalt 6 TB. So basically, TRS398 and TG51 are exactly the same. There's a small difference, we can talk about it later. But the basic equation for the determination of absorbed dose to the water for a beam quality Q is the same as TG51. You can see this, you know, uh, M is the corrected uh, uh, measured values uh, based on the, all the correction factors that we, uh, we have. For the, uh, the naming of them is different, but uh, the, these values are the same, you know, in the TRS, they call the, these factors as K, TPK, electron K, pole, whereas in TG51, it's P, P ion, P, T, P, P, electron P. Uh, so basically, these are the same factors, but different name. And the KQ factor, we said that if you are calibrating in any other beam, it, the KQ value will be different than one. If you are calibrating your own cobalt 60 units, so the KQ would be one. The previous question. So the IEA, a major difference between TG51 and TRS398, uh, according, you know, this is um, from uh, Hans book, consists of a beam quality specification, whereas TG51 recommends the percent of those uh, at 10 centimeter uh, X, whereas T TRS398 specifies beam quality by the tissue phantom ratio 20 over 10. This difference has little effect on the end result, namely the calculation of KQ or absorbed dose to water. So they, the, the difference is that using the percent depth dose at a depth of 10, whereas the TRS, they use it specify according to the tissue phantom ratio 20 uh, at the depth of 20 divided by the depth of 10. So the tissue phantom ratio method is simpler to implement as it avoids the use of a lead filter or those measurements at the max, which is the somewhat messy example width of the dose peak relative to the chamber cavity diameter and the question of residual electron contamination at the max in spite of the lead filter. So this is just a preference, but at the end result, these two values, they come up to the, to the same absorbed dose to water. In addition, the determination of tissue phantom ratio does not require displacement correction, nor is, is it sensitive to small symmet uh, systematic errors in positioning of the chamber at each depth. Why? Because when you do a, uh, you know, uh, a ratio of the uh, tissue phantom ratio, the, when you do a ratio, the, all the uh, other factors will be uh, factorized or will be one. So that's the only difference between TG51 and TRS398 protocol. Of course, many of the, uh, you know, uh, in the US and, and Canada, they've all basically used the TG51, whereas in many of the uh, countries, they use TRS398. It is because the IEA, they can, they can uh, you know, deliver or they can assist countries who needed you know, uh, like sometimes equipment, uh, needed calibration of their equipment to send to the IEA, they do it for free. So uh, people, they use it. And in both cases, you have, you know, spreadsheet that you can follow and uh, use accordingly. So the reference conditions for the calibration of photon and electron beams in the TRS are the same as in the TG51. The TRS-398 also provides worksheets which guide the user in a step-by-step -step implement of the protocol. So if you go and search to the IA website, you can get a spreadsheet in the Excel. So you just uh, plug in the values, the measured values that you have, and then you can get the dose to uh, the calibration dose to water for photon and electron beams accordingly. So the only comments mentioned in the book is that the TG51 and the TRS398 protocols are similar, except for the minor difference in a beam quality specification and notation. 
there is no reason why one protocol could be followed worldwide in this day and age it does not make sense to promote uh, these more or less identical protocols packaged with different things and notations. So uh, I, I believe that the, the author means that the both uh, protocols, they follow the same uh, procedures and they all have, uh, they come up with the, you know, the uh, same end results is calibrating your beam uh, to water. Uh, basically, uh, the, uh, the other sections, I just uh, put one slide for the other sections, although they are, uh, you know, uh, more explanation, but because of time, I think I have uh, done over an hour. For the part eight, they talk about exposure from radioactive sources. Of course, the exposure rate from a radioactive source can be determined from the photon energy fluence and the relevant mass energy absorption coefficient for air assuming charge particle equilibrium so this is the dose uh, from a radioactive source which is equal to the uh, exposure divided by uh, multiplied by the uh, uh, the energy of uh, uh, generating an ion pair in air which is also the energy fluence multiplied by the energy mass energy absorption coefficient of air therefore the if you are measuring uh, the exposure, you can use this formula to get the exposure from a radioactive element. Uh, this is only one slide for this part. The second, the uh, uh, last part is talking about other methods of measuring absorbed dose. Of course, these uh, uh, methods um, are uh, used in some clinics. Uh, to measure those uh, calorimetry, chemical dosimetry, solid state methods, silicon diodes, radiographic film. And uh, of course, in the book, they specify each one and how to use it. And uh, I refer you to go and uh, read about these uh, different methods for measuring absorbed dose. By this, I will end uh, my talk and uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Khan is is uh, attending or watching. But uh, if he's attending, do you remember what year was this taken or where? Dr. Khan is online. No, he is not online today. Uh, so just to, um, uh, this is actually was taken in Bahrain in 2007, uh, where we had uh, organized a, um, a, uh, a training course, and I think uh, from the IEA uh, sponsored, uh, it was ACMP with AAPM, and uh, AAPM, AAPM, right, I remember AAPM sponsored event. And in this conference, uh, Dr. Khan was kind enough to uh, get with him the third edition at that time, the third edition of his book. And uh, he distributed, uh, I think, more than 20 copies uh, of his book, free of charge, to each uh, delegation from uh, around 20 countries. And I got one representing Lebanon at that time, and he signed the book. Uh, for each of the delegates, and I still have that book. With this, I would like to thank you all for attending. And uh, 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 again, this is a reference book for medical physics all around the world. Whenever you uh, uh, study medical physics, you have to go through this book because it gives you a, a quite a good information, and uh, especially the sixth edition, this one has a very easy to read and uh, more examples in the text uh, for you, for a students to, to study and to comprehend the material uh, very easily. Thank you very much. And thank you, Asad, for giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, connect to, uh, you know, uh, students and uh, graduates of medical physics in, uh, in the region that you have. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, we do have a few questions in the chat. If you would be so kind, I can go through them and then you can answer. Uh, hold a second. 
Okay, wow. Yes. Okay, so the first question we have is, could you please, KQ should be measured for each chamber? For example, if KQ is measured with semiflex and we calibrate by pharma, we have to measure and calibrate by same chamber? No, KQ is, is uh, uh, yeah, it's measured for each chamber and at uh, each energy. But this will be given uh, for you in a tabulated form. So you don't need to measure it. You actually, you, when you, you know your, uh, that you know your ion chamber, the model number and uh, the exact model. So you go into the, uh, you know, EJ, TG51, they have tabulated values for KQ. You can uh, get them from the uh, tabulated values based on the energy that you are using. Dr. Dr. Ibrahim, if, if we measure TPR 2010 by the Smithlex, and we calibrate by the farmer. That's that point that I want to have answered. Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat the questions? I didn't understand this. So yeah, the yeah, KQ yeah. values are are, are are fixed depending yeah, yeah, on I, the I, I know chamber, that. right? I know that. Yes. Yeah, I know that's from the table and tabulated, but uh, TPR10 must be measured from the related dosimetry. Then if, if uh, my question is, if we have a two different chamber, one of them use it for, for example, Simiflex use it for measuring TPRT 20, 2010 or KQ, and we calibrate it by the farmers. That's that yes. point that I own. So at that times we can use different chamber in your opinion. Yeah, but then you have to multiply by correction factor. So you, you can uh, uh, actually do a, a correction factor. You, you put the same setup if you have another chamber. So you measure uh, you know, uh, for the same setup in both chambers. And this will give you the exact uh, number. So you can uh, uh, deduce uh -huh. or get the calibration factor from chamber A to chamber B. And then use the calibration factor that you will get during the measurement. Yes. yes. So you mean that for the calibration, we have to measure uh, TPR 2010, uh, we can say KQ and reading by the same chamber. If, you yes. if, you, if we, we use different chamber, you have to multiply by the correction factor. Exactly, true. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have another question in the chart. This question says, can I use solid water phantom for output tuning? Can I use solid water for output tuning? Um, usually it's not recommended, you know, for the uh, water, uh, for the solid phantom, uh, because um, uh, what they recommend in TG51 and uh, TRS is that you have to use water for calibration. You can make, a, I use a, you know, quality checks. So for example, I use my solid water uh, to check the, uh, you know, calibration of the B, but when I want to tune it, I have to put the water phantom, which is the uh, most recommended. But you can use it as a as a checking. You know, for a, for for example, each month for you if you want to do the uh, quality assurance on your uh, Linux, uh, you can use the plastic phantom. Uh, but if you see that the uh, calibration is off more than two percent, so you have to put the water phantom, <laughs> and you have to do the calibration based on water phantom. The tuning. So we have another question in the chat. It says, "Can you please discuss the dosimetry of an MR-based Linux?" Okay, so the MR-based Linux, uh, uh, it has a, a different, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, parameters. Is that you have to have uh, certain tools that is equivalent with the MR, but basically the uh, the the same. The same setup, the same protocol is uh, valid for MR Linux, for uh, Linux, uh, regular X-ray Linux. But of course, you have to be attentive to be using the equipment has to be, you know, uh, magnetically uh, safe. But basically, they use the same. 
I don't All see right. any difference uh, with the with uh, with both because the MR Linux is only used for imaging the uh, you know the the patients so that to make sure that the uh, uh, target is hit correctly. And the last question in the chart is, what are 50 stand for in KR50 electron factor? What are? What are 50 stand for in KR50 electron factor? R50 is the, uh, the uh, radiation at 50% of 50%, uh, 50 percent, 50 percent, you know, uh, range. When you, it's the range at 50 percent radiation. So you can get it from the graph. You you find the 50 percent, uh, 50 percent ionization or radiation on the graph. So that you get the R50, the range of the uh, electrons with the 50 percent uh, ionization. Okay. So if there are no more questions, we would like to conclude this session. Ibrahim Durrani, sir, it was a pleasure to have you and 